Chapter 4 There was nothing more perfect than waking up by the sea and watching the sunrise. Every time he saw it, Craig couldn't believe how lucky he was. By six o'clock in the morning, the copper from the Midlands was walking towards the sea with his surfboard tucked under his arms, his footprints in the damp sand the first of the day. He reached the water's edge. The white thrill of surf had looked like nothing from the hut, but once he got up close he realized the waves were pretty big. He ran straight into the water without stopping. His breath was taken away for a split second by the cold, but he carried on, paddling out behind the waves. He surfed for nearly an hour. Craig was no expert and he envied the surfers who cut through the water with grace and elegance as if they were at one with the waves. He knew that came with years of practice. These guys were devoted. They served every day, in all conditions. They were fanatics. He'd heard their tales in the bar often enough. They told him about the surfing hot spots as far away as Hawaii, India and Australia, and their stories inspired him. He admired their devil-may-care attitude to life. They lived to surf. That was it. They picked up work when they could, where they could. They didn't worry about anything else. They had no responsibilities. That kind of mindset didn't really suit him, being in the police. Until recently, Craig figured he had the best of both worlds. Where were these guys going to be in their old age? None of them would have a pension, just their memories. It was only now that he'd started to have doubts, to begin thinking differently, that he wondered about whether he'd really got it right. Craig had given everything to his career. He loved his hometown, and he'd wanted to contribute to its future. He wanted to make it a safe place, to protect his fellow townspeople from harm, to give them hope. Someone had once given him hope, after all, which was why he was lucky enough to be here now, enjoying the crystal clear water. By the time he got back to the beach hut with his surfboard, the early morning sun had nearly dried him off after his dip in the sea. He pulled on his jeans and walked up the beach to the cafe in the arcade, taking a table outside. He ordered a surfer's breakfast of bacon, sausage, egg, mushrooms, tomato, beans, hash browns, toast and a pot of tea. A guy he knew vaguely, Rusty, pulled up a chair next to him and sat down. That was the great thing about Haverton. You didn't see someone for months, but when you bumped into them, it was as if you'd seen them yesterday. Hey, buddy, how's it going? Rusty was from South Africa and was a photographer. He took pictures of the sea, blew them up onto canvas and sold them out of a camper van on the front. The tourists loved these shots, which funded Rusty's lifestyle. He didn't have to answer to anyone. 
He'd helped Craig out when he'd started surfing last summer. And Craig knew he would never be as good as Rusty could be in the water. Good, thanks, replied Craig. Though I've had a rough time of it the past few weeks. He didn't know if Rusty would even remember he was a copper. Rusty nodded. He looked up at the sky. Bad times, man. His hair was bleached blonde by the sun. His skin was tanned, and his bright blue eyes shone out. Craig felt a twinge of envy at his lifestyle. Rusty would never have experienced the stress that Craig went through on a daily basis because of his job. The dryness in your mouth because you didn't know how things were going to turn out, or whether you were going to make the right decisions. And even if you did, whether you were going to make a difference. And even if you did make a difference, whether it was then going to backfire. Craig sighed. He didn't want to turn into a cliché of the disillusioned cop. So what have you been up to? He asked. Rusty took a tiny roll-up cigarette out of a tin in his pocket and lit it. He took a drag, sucked in the smoke, then blew it in a thin stream up in the air. Then he began to tell Craig what he'd been doing. He'd spent two months in Goa, then a month in Ireland playing at festivals with some friends who had a band. Now he was back in Everdeen to spend August teaching surfing to the tourists until the days grew short. Craig put his head back and let the sun warm up the skin on his face as he listened. Rusty's life was as far away from his own as you could get. Every minute of Craig's life was accounted for. He didn't have a choice from the second he woke up. Did he envy Rusty? He had very little, just his camper van, his surfboard and some worn and faded clothes, but he took opportunities as they presented themselves. Craig thought of his one-bedroom apartment by the waterfront. The furniture he'd filled it with was all bought and paid for. He had a car, a wardrobe full of clothes and a top-of-the-range entertainment system. They were all the rewards of a tough job. Yet somehow the thought that nothing was going to change was constantly nagging at him. In the future, Craig would get a promotion, then probably a wife and kids, then maybe a house. There was nothing wrong with any of that, but would he ever see the world, like Rusty? Would he ever wake up in the morning and think? What now? Where next? Who knew? Even when he was down here at Everton, he knew he was on board time. It wouldn't be long before it was time to get back into the car and drive up the motorway. Then he would have to get back into his uniform and clock on. He'd be out in his police squad car, patrolling the streets, never knowing how much trouble the day was going to bring. He rarely came home feeling he'd done a good job. It wasn't that he was shocked by what people did, far from it. It was because he knew why they did it.
The saying, there but for the grace of God go I was often in his thoughts. Next morning, Jenna woke at seven and listened to the sound of seagulls circling. She knew they would be feasting on the packets of leftover chips and kebabs dropped in the streets. They were scavengers to the end, those seagulls. She lay for a moment looking at the ceiling. There was a huge brown stain in the middle of it that seemed to bulge. She lived in fear of the roof caving in, imagining the bloke upstairs falling through the floor and landing on top of her, leaving a man-shaped hole. She gave herself five minutes to decide whether she was going to go through with her plan. Even though it would mean she had failed. She had been so determined to prove herself. You think you're better than I am, don't you? This had been her mother's parting shot. Yes, I do. Jenna had told her, and her mum had just laughed. She could hear the cackle now, fueled by fags and cheap bottles of supermarket own brand vodka. Her mother's bloke went and bought a bottle of vodka every morning from the corner shop and by four o'clock in the afternoon the pair of them would have polished it off just in time to head to the pub. Of course she thought she was better than that. Jenna had dreamed that, if she got away from the grimy house where she had been brought up, she could make something of herself. She had to escape the lazy, drunken woman who had given birth to her and four other kids. Her mom had never been a proper mother to any of them. If anything, they had to look after her. There were days when Jenna hadn't gone to school because her mom was so drunk that she was scared to leave her. Jenna could remember going back to her friends' houses sometimes. She had looked on, wide-eyed as their mothers fussed over them, made them tea and asked about their day. She had sat in the bedrooms of her school friends, with their crisply ironed duvet covers and matching curtains, and fluffy dressing gowns and slippers. They had clean towels hanging in the bathroom and toilet paper on a holder. There were proper mealtimes when the whole family sat round the table. They had fathers who came home and hugged them. They had fathers who would never raise a voice, let alone a hand, to their wife or kids. Jenna wasn't jealous, but she never invited anyone back to her house. She would have been too ashamed because their house was a hovel. The tiny front yard was studded with dog turds that baked hard in the sun or turned to mush in the rain. Sometimes, Jenna cleared them up but she ended up gagging. Inside the house the lounge was covered in dog hairs and the wallpaper had been scratched off the wall. Every surface in the kitchen was covered in dirty cups and plates, cereal boxes and takeaway cartons. There were empty bottles everywhere, but no glasses. Her mom just poured vodka straight into a can of 7-Up and glugged it. In the hall, there were tins of dog food appended straight onto the floor. Her mom argued that the dogs only took two seconds to eat it, because they were always starving, 
So what was the point of dirtying a dish? Whatever happened, Jenna wasn't going back there. She blinked back the familiar tears. It was up to her now. She had no one else, and that was how she liked it, even though it was hard. She forced herself to get out of bed. She could lie there all day, but then she would be just like her mother. She had to keep going, even though she knew that what she was about to do was wrong. Jenna got herself dressed, before she could change her mind. She put on a bikini, then chose a dress. She didn't want to stand out, so she picked out one with a simple wide halter neck. In a bag, she put a towel, some sun cream, a bottle of water and a book. She tied her hair in a high ponytail and finished off the look with a pair of sunglasses and some flip-flops decorated with big flowers. As she left the house, she looked like any normal young girl about to spend a day on the beach. Jenna had just enough money for the bus fare to Everton. It was only five miles away, but it might as well have been a thousand. Her heart lifted every time she went down the hill towards the bay. It was as unlike Takam as you could get. Everywhere you looked there was beauty, from the rolling hills to the sea to the sun on the distant horizon. There were shades of green and blue and shimmering gold. She'd come here before, sometimes with her mates. They ate chips on the beach, washed down with bottles of cider, and got the late bus back. They never went in the sea. That was for tourists and surfers. As far as Jenna was concerned, the sea might look nice, but it was cold and wet. She got off the bus in the center of the village where the traffic was insane. On a hot day, in the height of summer, you had to find a parking space by 9 o'clock or you had no hope. The pavements were crowded with people heading to the beach, lugging their beach bags, buckets, spades and body boards. It was a nightmare getting through, dodging pushchairs and dogs on leads, but Jenna kept her head down and pushed on. In the end, she walked in the road, because it was easier. The traffic was so slow that she was unlikely to get run over. She didn't think about what she was going to do. She had no choice, she told herself, over and over. She passed the ship aground, the pub in the middle of Everdeen where everyone hung out. There was a huge poster outside. Advertising their end of season pop singing competition. The first prize was a hundred pounds. For a moment, Jenna hesitated. Her friends were always trying to persuade her to enter competitions like this. They were always telling her she had an amazing voice, but she didn't have the confidence. It was one thing mucking about in the ice cream kiosk, but it was quite another walking out on stage. Anyway, even if she did enter, and even if she won, what then? She'd have a hundred quid in her pocket, 
but that wasn't enough to live on or to pay the rent she owed. Her current plan was going to make her more money. She turned away and walked on. As she passed the coffee shop in the arcade at the top of the beach, she realized that she hadn't eaten or drunk anything since she'd left the ice cream kiosk yesterday afternoon. She pulled at the last of her change and estimated she had enough for a cup of tea. With three sugars in it, it might keep her going for a while. She ducked inside and ordered a takeaway cup. As she paid and turned to leave, she was just taking off the plastic lid when she bumped straight into a man heading for the counter. Luckily she hadn't been holding the cup close to her, or it would have spilled all down her front. Instead, it went all over the floor. Oh my god, I'm so sorry. The man put out his hand and touched her arm. Are you okay? I'm fine, said Jenna, looking up, right into the most incredible eyes. Eyes that were silver gray, with the longest lashes she had ever seen on a man, and set in a kind face, too. I wasn't looking where I was going. Neither was I. She managed to laugh. Wow. This guy was really good looking, she thought. There were always a lot of good looking guys in Everton, but he was even hotter than most. He had dark curly hair, cropped close and was lean and muscular in his t-shirt and faded jeans. Let me get you another. He looked at her, his dark brows meeting in a frown. Seriously. Go and sit down and I'll bring you one over. Jenna bit her lip thinking how wonderful it would be to sit down while he brought her a fresh drink. Then she remembered what she was doing here, and realized that today of all days she didn't want to bring attention to herself. The last thing she needed was to strike up conversation with a handsome stranger who might remember her. It's okay. It's fine. I'm in a hurry. Honestly. I have to go. She smiled and walked away as quickly as she could, throwing her empty cup into the nearest bin. Eventually Jenna made it onto the sand. The tide was in which meant at the moment there was little room for people to set up camp. As the sea inched out again, the visitors began to spread out their rugs, putting up their windbreaks and laying out all the things they needed for the day. The sun grew ever more sparkling, welcoming the crowds with its rays. Jenna spread out her towel at the bottom of the bank beneath the beach huts. She'd chosen her pitch carefully. She wanted to be on the edge of the crowds, so she could watch, but she didn't want to stand out. Everyone was so busy having a good time that they weren't going to notice her. Chapter 5 Craig noticed Jenna straight away. She was the girl he bumped into at the coffee shop. She was sitting at the bottom of the bank outside his beach hut. She looked as if she'd stepped out of a 1950s film set, 
with her curves and her high ponytail and her retro dress. She really was very pretty, and he wondered why she was here on her own. Maybe she was waiting for her mates, or her boyfriend. Maybe that was why she hadn't let him buy her a drink, because there was another bloke in the picture. Craig told himself to stop staring but he wasn't sure what else to do. There was certainly no point in trying to surf while the beach was this busy. Even though there were supposed to be separate areas for surfers and swimmers, Craig could see it was chaos in the water. He wasn't a good enough surfer to avoid hitting someone if they got in his way. He'd wait until later this evening, when the crowds had gone. The waves would still be good. In the meantime, he put up his striped deck chair in front of the hut and sat watching all the people on the beach. He wondered who they were and where they had come from as little dramas unfolded. A teenage boy fussed over his gran, making sure she was comfortable. Two small toddlers fought over a spade until their mother intervened. A young couple stretched out on a rug together, sharing the headphones on an iPod. His eyes kept straying back to the girl with the ponytail. She was still on her own. Maybe he should go and talk to her? or offer her another drink. If his friends were here, he knew they would be encouraging him, but without them he felt shy. Maybe she wanted to be her on her own and didn't want company? Craig decided in the end he would leave her alone. He picked up his book instead and started to read. Jenna spread her things out around her, then rubbed some sun cream on her arms and the back of her neck. She didn't want to burn in the heat of the sun. From behind her sunglasses, she examined all the groups of people around her. She made sure she knew exactly who was in each group, and how the dynamics worked. Small families with toddlers would be the best target. The parents of small children were always distracted. Jenna had never stolen anything in her life before, but she knew plenty of people who had. Members of her family were always coming home with knocked off gear or things that had fallen off the back of a lorry. Her mom was always sticking stuff in her pocket when she was out shopping. It was a way of life for them, but Jenna hadn't had to stoop that low before. She felt sick that it had come to this, but she was desperate. Her mom's words came back to her time and again. You're no better than the rest of us. Well, maybe not, but at least she'd had a go in getting out there and trying to make a better life for herself. Anyway, she reminded herself, this was a one-off. She told herself she was only getting back what had been stolen from her a couple of weeks ago. She knew deep down that was no excuse, of course but she didn't know what else to do. It was either this or be thrown out of her room by the professor on Monday. Jenna looked around the beach again. She knew all the rules of pickpocketing. 
When you came from the kind of family she did, you picked up these things along the way. She knew how to identify an easy victim, a mark, and the best conditions to steal from them. You had to wait until they were off their guard and weren't paying attention. The beach was perfect for that, because people were concentrating so hard on having a good time that they forgot to look after their valuables. Of course, it was better to have an accomplice, a partner in crime, but that was out of the question. Jenna could hardly have asked one of her mates to come and help her. She decided to try the ice cream queue first. There were three vans parked along the beach, and the searing heat meant that the lines outside them were already long. She waited nearby until she saw a harassed-looking father join the queue with two small children in tow. She slipped in behind him, guessing it was going to be at least ten minutes before they got to the window. By then, everyone would be more hot and bothered than ever. She examined her target. She could see his wallet in the back pocket of his shorts. He was doing his best to control his two children, who were bawling in fury that their ice cream wasn't coming sooner. When he bent down to tell off one of them, she whisked the wallet out of his pocket and into her own. Before the children had stopped arguing, she left the queue. Anyone would think she was just bored with waiting. She didn't wait to see the man's reaction when he discovered his loss. At first he would assume he had dropped his wallet on the walk over, or that he'd forgotten to put it in his pocket. It would probably be at least 20 minutes before he figured out he'd been pickpocketed, and by then he wouldn't be sure where it had happened. Jenna would be long gone. Her heart was hammering and her mouth was dry as she made her way back to her towel. She felt slightly sick, too. Although she wasn't sure whether that was a combination of the heat and the fact that she still hadn't eaten. She opened the wallet, pulled out three 20-pound notes and a crumpled fiver and put them in her bag. All she had to do now was get rid of the evidence. She walked a couple of hundred yards back up the beach to where six big black bins were regularly emptied throughout the day. She lifted the lid, recoiling slightly from the stench of chip wrappers and dirty nappies baking in the sunshine, and dropped the wallet in. She wasn't going to touch the credit cards. That wasn't her level of crime at all, although she knew people who would have found them useful. So far, so good, she thought. She didn't want to think about whether she drew in the family's day out. Feeling guilty was not going to help with the task in hand. She went back to her blanket for a few minutes and waited until her heart had stopped hammering. Then she decided to head up the beach in the other direction. She'd spotted a young couple walking down to the water, hand in hand. The girl had very carefully placed her handbag under a towel before they all left as if that was going to fool anyone. Some people, thought Jenna, 
We're very stupid. Craig woke with a start, realizing he'd fallen asleep in the heat of the midday sun. There was sweat trickling down his forehead, and he was dying of thirst. He should probably go back into the hut, into the shade. He sat up and glanced around, mostly to see if anyone had spotted him dribbling while he was asleep. He looked down to the bottom of the bank to see if the girl with the ponytail was still there, but her towel was empty. Her stuff was still there, though, so she had to be around. He scanned the crowds, looking for her, and thought he could spot her ponytail and white dress further up the beach. He reached down for the pair of binoculars he kept by him. There were always interesting things to look at, a passing ship, a hang glider, a bird of prey, and it also meant he could keep an eye on the surfing conditions when the tide was out. At last, he caught sight of the girl through the lenses. Was he being a bit of a stalker? Surely it wasn't normal, to spy on someone like this, but the girl had fascinated him. He watched her as she walked further up the beach. A few moments later, Craig couldn't believe his eyes as she approached someone's empty rug, reached under a towel found a bag and took out a purse, all in one fluid movement that took less than five seconds. Then she walked calmly away, back up the beach towards him. He didn't know why he was so shocked. After all, he was used to this sort of behavior. He arrested people like this girl every day of the week in the town center. Admittedly, they usually worked in gangs rather than on their own. There would be one on lookout, and one causing a distraction. Maybe he was shocked because he viewed Everton as an escape. He'd built it up in his mind as some sort of romantic hideaway where nothing bad ever happened, but of course it did. A crowded beach was the perfect place for a petty thief. He followed her progress back up the beach. He watched her take money out of the purse, stuff the notes in her pocket then ditched the purse in the bins as she walked past. His heart sank as he realized that this meant she was definitely guilty, although if he was going to confront her he needed proof. He felt a sour taste in his mouth. He didn't want to deal with this, but now that he had seen it happen, he couldn't ignore it even if he was off duty. Of course, he could just turn a blind eye, but that wasn't in Craig's nature. He'd never been one to stand by and let people do wrong. Even after what had happened to him lately, he was still a policeman, first and foremost, or maybe he just imagined what had happened. It was certainly hot enough to make you see things, and the heat of the sun made everything hazy. He'd had a beer as well, from the fridge, which might have impaired his judgment. Maybe he should just carry on reading. It was too beautiful a day for trouble. Then he sighed and picked up his binoculars. He would sit and watch her to see what she did next. 
If she just sat on her towel and did nothing else, he decided, he would give her the benefit of the doubt and leave her alone. Jenna drank half a bottle of water and lay back down in the sun. She couldn't believe how easy it had been. She mustn't get carried away, though. Word might start spreading on the beach. She would just do one more today, then go to the other beach around the point tomorrow. One thing she had learned from her family as she grew up was never go back to the scene of the crime. The other thing she knew was that even if someone did call the police, they wouldn't come out. They weren't going to bother to respond to a crime where the victims had been stupid enough to leave their stuff unattended. On a busy Saturday in the summer, when they were already understaffed, there were far more important things they could be dealing with. She just had to hold her nerve. There was over a mile of beach to choose from. She was anonymous. Everyone looked right through her. If Jenna needed proof that she was a nobody, this was it. She sat up again. The heat was intense, as if the sun was burning a hole in the sky. It was hard to look at the sea without squinting. The light reflecting off the water was almost white. One more, Jenna decided. She'd spotted a family. Earlier she'd seen the dad take his wallet out and give the three kids money for ice creams. They looked well off. They had all the kit. UV tints and thick, plush beach towels and a sleek spenny Alana lead as well as a cool box brimming with all manner of treats. Jenna's stomach crumbled and she realized that she still hadn't eaten anything. She watched as the mother opened the cool box and rummaged inside, handing out drinks. She wondered if they knew how lucky they were. She'd never been on holiday. What do you want to go on holiday for? Her mom had asked. We live by the sea. People pay to come here. Why would we want to pay to go somewhere else? Jenna knew she shouldn't sit there feeling sorry for herself to justify her actions. This wasn't about self-pity, or feeling bitter. This was about survival. Besides, thought Jenna, this family could definitely afford to lose a few quid. She watched while the mother zipped up the children's wetsuits and gathered up the towels to take down to the water then applied sun cream to the backs of their necks. The dad shoved his wallet in the cool box, obviously thinking that no one would look in there for something to steal. She shook her head in disbelief. The tide was at its lowest, so the family had a long way to walk to get to the sea. She watched until they were three quarters of the way there, then made her way over to their encampment. She plunked herself casually down on the rug, then lifted the cool box lid. She rummaged about inside, looking for all the world like a young girl finding the best thing to eat. She pulled out an egg roll oozing with mayonnaise, 
and a giant chocolate chip cookie. She looked down to the shoreline where the family had reached the water. It would take them at least ten minutes to walk back, even if they remembered that they had forgotten something vital. She devoured the roll, then rifled through the wallet as she munched on the biscuit. There was over a hundred quid in there. Three credit cards. A photo of the family, the kids in posh uniforms outside a massive house. For some reason this made her feel better. They weren't going to miss the money. She might as well take the whole lot. There was no point in leaving them any. They were obviously loaded. The man would be furious for about an hour, then he'd go to the cash point and get some more money. It was no big deal. It was his own fault for leaving his wallet unattended. She folded up the notes and stuffed them in her pocket, then put the lid back on the cool box. She felt slightly sick from eating so fast in the heat of the sun. Then she stood up and walked away. Chapter 6 Craig's heart was thumping, which was crazy. This wasn't some stakeout on a dodgy estate where things could go badly if he made the wrong move. So why was he worried? He should just march over, collar the girl and make people aware that this kind of crime could happen, even somewhere as carefree as Everdeen. That might make them take more care of their valuables. Something was stopping him, though. He'd felt drawn to the girl the moment he had bumped into her in the cafe. He wanted to know why she was doing this. Instinct told him this wasn't her usual behavior. She didn't have the air of a hardened pickpocket, and the way she had taken food out of the cool box told him she was hungry. Although being hungry didn't excuse what she was doing, far from it. Craig knew that if his mates were here they wouldn't give her a chance, and that they'd call him soft. Well, maybe he was soft, softer than he admitted even to himself. In fact, he had to face up to it now. He'd lost his killer instinct. He'd been dragged over the coals, and even though he'd been cleared of blame, the experience had soured him. Where once he had felt it was his duty to see justice done, now he was asking himself questions. And a good cop shouldn't hesitate. He sighed put down his binoculars and got out of his deck chair. He could see her without them now, weaving her way among the holiday makers back to her towel. He paused for a moment, and watched as she sat down, then put her head in her hands. He could see by her body language that she felt guilty. Her shoulders were hunched and she moved slowly as she started gathering her things up ready to leave. Smart move, thought Craig, because it was about time she moved on. That last family looked as if they would cause a fuss, and it would be better for her if she wasn't around when they raised the alarm. 
He watched as she stuffed the last of her things in her bag and stood up. He walked down the last few feet of the bank and made his way towards her as she moved off. He fell into step beside her and put a hand on her arm. Hey, he said, not loudly, as he didn't want to cause alarm. She stopped. What? She looked straight at him. There was a moment of confusion, then she recognized him. You were in the cafe. I saw what you did, he told her. What? She repeated, frowning this time, and he saw that her eyes were amber speckled with gold. Spilled my tea, you mean? For a moment, in the heat of the sun, he doubted himself again. He felt awkward. This was far more difficult than an arrest, when he was in uniform. He wasn't quite sure what to say. Number I saw you nick that wallet out of the cool box. And take that purse out of that woman's handbag earlier. He pointed back down the beach. She shook her head. I don't know what you're talking about. She moved away and carried on walking. He walked beside her. I've got photos. She hesitated for a moment. Of what? Good enough evidence for a court of law. She turned on him. Go and hassle someone else, will you? You're being weird. I should have you arrested. I should have you arrested. You've been following me since this morning, taking pictures. That's stalking. He was impressed by the way she stood her ground. On the surface, she seemed defiant. A passerby would believe her innocence. But Craig had been trained to read body language. Her fists were clenched, and she refused to make eye contact. He was going to have to be more forceful to get her to admit her guilt. Yet somehow his heart wasn't in it. Maybe he should just let her go and be done with it. Thinking she had been caught would probably put her off doing it again, and this was supposed to be his week off. He just wanted to chill and get things straight in his head. This was like being back at work, if not worse. All he really wanted to do was sit back down and have a beer and maybe fall asleep again. Craig nearly gave up and let her go, but something inside him wanted to know more about her. He wanted to know why she was on the beach nicking money. He never had time, when he arrested people, to go into the whys and wherefores, and he was interested. I don't want to make a big scene, he told her. But I can't just let you walk off with all that money. She spread her hands, laughing. There is no money. I haven't even got enough for an ice cream. He held her gaze. Open your bag. Let me have a look. Leave me alone. Or I'm going to call for help. He looked around and then took his wallet out of his shorts. You better take a look at this. 
he flipped it open and showed her his police identification. She stared at it for a good five seconds before she finally dropped her eyes to the ground. She sighed and turned away. I didn't have any choice, she said, her voice tied with tears. We all have a choice, he replied. I've got a choice right now. I can take you into the nearest station. Or we can talk about it. What are you, my counselor, all of a sudden? She asked, crossly. He raised an eyebrow. Normal girls of your age don't come to the beach on their own and spend the day nicking money. You think I don't know that? She raised her voice, and he realized that people were looking. Look, he said. I'm a cop. By rights it's my duty to turn you in. But I'm on holiday. I don't want a load of hassle. He looked at her. She was staring down at the sand. The fight seemed to have gone out of her. And I bet you don't either. She looked up and put her hands on her hips. So what are you going to do? Give me some big lecture? It's not as if I don't know it's wrong. So why did you do it? She stared at him. Her eyes were huge in her face. He reached out a hand and touched her arm. Come on. Come inside and have a drink. We can talk about it. Jenna stood there. She didn't know what to do. All she knew was that the heat was suddenly unbearable and she felt sick. She wasn't scared. She didn't feel like running away. In fact, she almost felt a sense of relief. Her future was now going to be out of her hands. Someone else was going to be in control. She looked up at the bloke again. He was going to decide her fate. She didn't have to make the decisions anymore. She couldn't read the expression in his silver-gray eyes. She'd expected harshness and accusation but they seemed almost understanding. Come on, said the man, nodding his head up towards the faded blue beach hut behind him. We don't want to have this discussion in public. For a moment Jenna was tempted to run. She was wearing flip-flops which were impossible to run in, but she could kick them off. How far would she get? Not far, she knew. And he looked fit. She followed him obediently up the slope towards the beach hut. He had broad shoulders tapering down to a slender waist. He was wearing red surfing shorts decorated with flowers although there was nothing girly about him. He was lightly tanned, and his skin glistened where he'd put on sun cream. Despite her heart thumping, she managed a smile to herself. Nice work, Jenna. You've been caught red-handed by the hottest cop you've ever seen. 